Yeah, hello everybody. So my name is Nicholas Matsakis, uh, and I, well, I got already a brief intro, so I guess you kind of know who I am, but I'll just say it again. I'm co-leading of the Rust language design team. Uh, I've been involved in Rust since 2011, so I think I've been working on Rust for literally every Rust release, starting from 0 0.1 up to 1.0, up to what, I don't have no idea what our current release is, which is probably a good thing. Um, and yeah, I'm also at Amazon as a senior principal engineer. And my role there is kind of both to work on Rust, but also to oversee our overall language adoption story and, and programming language story and things like that. Right? And so you might wonder kind of which of these roles am I here speaking to you right now with respect to or with what hat am I wearing, as people say? And the answer is kind of neither, actually. Uh, I'm really here for a different thing, which is something that I'm trying to do uh, along with others in the project, which is this idea of authoring a Rust vision doc. And so our goal is essentially to, to try and answer this question of what comes next, right? We're 10 years in to the Rust journey. I think it's interesting that Hugo mentioned adoption as kind of a primary goal. Actually, let me see. I don't know. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, I have a slide on this later. It's okay. I'll get there. Uh, but I think adoption is, is an interesting question. It's not necessarily the only question that we might ask, right? As we look back on 10 years and we look forward, we're kind of, I at least find myself wondering, what could Russ be doing better, right? And the first thing I want to know is how is it working now? How does it feel for people who are using it? And by that, I mean Rust users. What are they finding helps them? What is difficult to learn or, or just difficult to use once they have learned it? But also the Rust maintainers. How does it feel working on Rust itself? I don't know how many of you, actually, well, why not? Show of hands, how many people work on Rust or a Rust library here? I see at least a few I recognize. Yeah, a whole bunch. Okay, that's good. That's awesome. So how does that feel, right? How does it feel to work on the real Rust project? But I'm also interested in hey, I have a library on Crates.io, and what's that like? Uh, you know, uh, does, that, does that load kind of, is it difficult to keep up with feature requests? Is it easy? Is it hard to figure out how to do security incidents? And so on. Um, and of course, last but not least, like companies adopting Rust, people, projects adopting Rust. How does it work to get Rust into a system where you already have a bunch of other code in production? And finally, of course, we want to know, so given all of that, what are the big things we could change that would actually make a real difference on that experience? And so the way we're going about it is, is talking to a bunch of people, taking detailed notes, transcripts actually, and then kind of record, going through that data and trying to extract out the themes that we hear. And so the idea is to not start with an assumption of what we know we're going to find, but to let the data take us. Right? And I would like to answer some some of these questions. What is Rust's mission? What are we here to do? Um, what do people value the most about Rust? Why are they choosing to use it? And of course, what will help them succeed? The other thing is, and I think this is a really important one, is not just what should we do with Rust, but how can we make building Rust better? And in particular, I'm really curious about this first part. How can we take advantage of growing Rust adoption? How can we get the companies who are using Rust to come and participate in the process of shaping Rust? Because I think that if we have this cycle, this flywheel, it's gonna make Rust kind of grow and become much better, much, much faster than if we try to have a central set of people out kind of figuring everything out and driving all the work independently. So when it comes to mission, I think the question that I find myself wondering is adoption, you know, in the beginning it was like, if something would grow adoption, it was obviously a good thing to do. Right? But I think that's not true anymore. You know, if we could turn Rust into JavaScript and suddenly have it running on all the world's browsers, well, I wouldn't do it, right? It wouldn't fulfill the purpose of Rust. It wouldn't, it's kind of like not adoption at any cost. We want adoption for the right things. And the more I think about it, it's kind of hard to say actually, what is Rust really for? 
because uh, you can use it for so many things, right? You can use it to build network services that run at high scale. You can use it to run on tiny little embedded devices. It's really pretty popular for CLI tools, development tools. So what is Rust's kind of killer app, you know, given all of that? Uh, and I don't, I don't think we have one in that sense. I think we have more of a, a zone, which is we're really great at anything that's foundational. And by that, I mean, it's the software that underlies everything else. That's sort of Rust's sweet spot. It's what we optimize and build Rust for. And when we make decisions, that's kind of the software we're targeting, this foundational software. And people used to call that system software, I think. I don't love that term because I think it's more limited, actually. I, I think foundational fits better what I see. And, eh, okay. and what I think I notice about this is when you're building something that's foundational, the requirements are higher. It has to be extra reliable. It has to be extra secure. Because everyone, you know, if it falls apart, if it has a fault, then all the stuff built on top has the same problem. It needs to be extra performant because it sets the floor, right? As, as fast as it goes, nobody else can go any faster than that. That's the thing they're building on. Uh, and uh, the last part is it has to be stable. It can't be, when we, when we want to evolve Rust, we want to make changes, but we have to respect all the stuff that's out there working now, right? We can't break that stuff in practice. And I think we've worked pretty hard to build out systems that let us release Rust every six weeks, evolve it, and actually make changes without disrupting users. But one of the questions I'm curious to get more feedback on is how well is that working? How much appetite is there for changing Rust? These are interesting questions to me. Um, and I noticed we don't have a great slogan. So you may notice we have these slogans we've developed over time and I find they line up pretty well with our goals. We don't seem to have one for low level control. I don't know, in my head it's no limits, meaning you can do whatever you have to do, but maybe someone can figure one out. Um, there is something that I think foundational software shouldn't be, but has traditionally been, which is kind of inaccessible and obscure. Like the domain of, of wizards, of, of people who have really obscure knowledge. If you've been working in C++ or systems programming, you kind of know what I mean. You meet these people who are just, that, that's like their thing, is they know how a, that low-level systems work. And they don't really know a lot about anything else. Right? And I think that's a fine, it's not anything wrong with that. But if we can find a way to make building foundational software accessible to a bigger pool of people, it's going to be something we do more broadly. It's going to be something that we can do faster. And we'll find that we can do a lot more interesting stuff. So the last thing I'll say is when I talk about foundational software, what I've seen is when you're building this kind of stuff, you also need to be able to build other kinds of software in Rust. So it's, it's not enough to just be able to build the low-level components that underlie everything. Not if, that doesn't necessarily have enough value to make Rust make sense. And let me give you a, a little story about it. So there's a service at, at Amazon called Serverless SQL, or DSQL, I think, Aurora DSQL, that launched last reInvent. It's pretty cool. I think it's cool. It's like a serverless SQL database. But that's not the, the, the coolest part about it to me isn't what it does. It's how they built it. So they started out building it in, actually in Kotlin, as it happens, uh, that was many years ago, and found that they were having some problems in their data plane. They weren't able to get the latency they needed. So they ported that part to Rust, right? And now they had better performance in the data plane, but they were still building the control plane in Rust, or sorry, in Kotlin and other parts of the system. And then they started to find, hey, they're out of sync. We can't share code between them because even though that control plane doesn't have any, it's not foundational in the same way, it doesn't have the performance requirements, it still needs to share logic with the data plane. It still needs to have common subroutines. So, and they found that when they put them together, they just didn't work. So they took that down and they rewrote it in Rust too. Right? And then what they were surprised to find was, oh, actually, this is pretty pleasant. Like, even though Rust is made and optimized for low-level systems, it works great for the control plane. And that let them move the whole thing much faster. And in the end, they even built their internal web page in Rust, I think using Leptos maybe, I'm not sure, or some variant thereof. But so being able to go from low level all the way up to high level and back and be like pretty good, right? You don't have to be the best, <laughs> but good enough that it's not too painful. That, that's a really important value of Rust. And it's one that I've heard, even as I'm doing these interviews, I hear it coming up time and time again, this idea that Rust is versatile and something that can scale. So I think that's a really important property that we have to not lose. And so I, I mentioned adoption not being good enough. I mean, I think if I were to put a words on Rust mission, it would be something like this. 
we want to build the best tool we can, the best language we can for building foundational software for everyone, right? And that everyone is meant to capture that accessibility and, and usability and kind of opening the pool to a bigger pool of developers. So why, why, am I, why do the vision doc, right? Um, I mentioned that we want to say, figure out where we're going for the next 10 years. And my sense is that within the Rust organization, there's a need for us now, like we've got, we've grown a lot. <laughs> um, you know, we started with like, I don't even know. We started with a very small set of developers and we've grown to many different teams working independently. And I think we need to have a, a kind of coherent idea of where we're going uh, to, to stay, continue to be effective. But there's another reason that I have this in mind, which is that I feel like there are conversations we don't have a good space to have. And I'm having some of them personally uh, in some of those other roles. Like when I'm at Amazon, I'm hearing things from Amazon teams and from Amazon uh, business leaders. Like, first of all, I'm seeing where, where is Rust really successful at Amazon? Well, we're using it, I mentioned, to build these at scale network services. We're also using it for low level consumer devices and a few other places, but these are like the two biggest domains, right? And I'm seeing that, that that for everyone part of the promise, the accessibility is really key. And that's actually a kind of interesting, to me, historical anecdote from Amazon. As you may or may not know, Amazon's big on Java. We use a lot of Java and it's worked really well for us. And the reason that that's true is that there were, people were using C++, but they found, hey, if we use Java, if we use something memory safe, we can actually hire like, fresh college graduates who don't have that specialized skill set and throw them at this project and they, you know, they'll learn as they go, but they can't do that much damage, essentially. They can't bring down the whole system, right? And they become really skilled and they're able to build efficient things. Rust has that same property. You can kind of bring in an intern, review their pull requests and know that they're not gonna crash the whole system and leak your SSH key out to the internet uh, without at least writing unsafe, right? At least you'll see it. So that's sort of a key enabler that lets you really scale up and go much higher. Um, but so, so I think, I think Rust has that property. Rust can be, um, can be this, this successor language where there are spaces where Java couldn't go, right? Low level systems, high performance systems where Java couldn't, could, doesn't make sense to use. And Rust can take over there and, and actually help transition away from memory unsafe practices and be part of that solution. But there are some things we have to address if we're really going to deliver on that safety promise, I think we need to have, for example, a strong enough ecosystem. This is something I'm not hearing us talk about, but I would like us to be talking about. Um, we're seeing in the EU that there are rising regulatory requirements. I forgot the right acronym, but you know, there's this act that it says like you need to be using well-maintained software. Well, if I go digging around the Rust ecosystem, I see a lot of really well-designed, really thoughtful crates that have a single maintainer, right? And my definition of well-maintained does not include a single maintainer. I just think it's not possible. I don't care how good a job you do. It's, you can't meet those requirements, right? Um, and I get nervous about our upgrade strategy. Like we have a lot of crates I use are 0 0.2, 0 0.3. I don't know if they backport security fixes. Luckily, they don't have a lot of them to backport in the first place, but I can't rely on that staying true. Uh, and I also know that there's you know, a lot of my packages build multiple versions of something. So maybe I have the security fix in one version, but I don't have it in the other. We don't have a clear policy around this and our MSRV isn't very clear. And I think we're not, these are requirements that don't arise. They're not such a big deal if you're working on a single project or building a library. They become a big deal when you're trying to build something at a high scale across many teams in a company and you have to deal with these kind of regulatory requirements and all that stuff. So I wanted a space for us to talk about that and look and say, hey, these are some big problems that if we just think incrementally, we're never gonna get there. That was the role of the vision doc. So I have absolutely no idea how much time I have. Let me just check here. Okay, yeah, I'm doing okay. So who are we talking to? Well, Rust users, global Rust communities. I'm really curious to understand what is it like? We have a lot of users in Europe, a lot in the US. What is it like using Rust in Asia? What is it like in Africa? So we're talking to groups like that. Um, I mentioned Rust maintainers, but of course the reason I'm here today and, and the audience I'm talking to now, companies that are adopting or considering adopting Rust are a key sort of stakeholder as well. Right? And so what I wanna know from you, how did it feel? 
What's your journey to Rust been like? How's your experience been in onboarding? Questions like these. Right? I think the, the, the kinds of things that I think are going to be discussed throughout this, this track. And the way it works, we're doing interviews, which means I would sit down and talk one-on-one, -on -one, or one of us from the group would, for about 30 to 45 minutes. The key part is no wrong answers. You just talk to us about your experience. Um, and you know, we try to dig in and really understand what, what is going on. And so I'm kind of running up against the end. I'm helping to get us back on schedule. It's good. Uh, but what, what I'm going to be doing, actually, during the track today, at least starting at 11, is I'm holding five one-on-one -on -one interviews today. You can actually go to that URL, calendly.com slash Nico Matsakis, uh, and click on the Rust Week industry track and see sign up for one of them. Um, I think it, I would love it if you would. And uh, if you don't, if you aren't able to get in that, because there's only five, then send me an email and we'll, we'll work it out. Um, but what I want to do is just do one of those interviews and see how it goes. Talk about those questions, hear what you have to say. Um, and that'll become part eventually of, of this eventual doc that we're all authoring. So thanks a lot. Uh, that's all I have to say right now, maybe more later, but I'm happy to take some questions or whatever we have time for. Yeah. Anyone who has a question for Nico? We do one question now, but if you're interested, do sign up for one of these interviews. Nico, it's great. I think you're doing these. Also great talk. Thanks a lot. Yep. Yeah, a lot. go talk to Nico and tell him, tell him all about your journey, I would say. It's not my computer. All right. Thanks, everybody.